Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome. It's so great to have you tune us in and turn us on. Like, yeah. Daniel Grauer is joining us here today. I'm going to introduce him in a minute. The book is Psychedelic Consciousness, Plant Intelligence for Healing Ourselves and Our Fragmented World. And I want to share a couple of things too, but he's honestly, Daniel has got like the whole thing covered. Um, hi, Benny. Hi, David. How are, hey, hi. are we doing? How are we hitting them? Psychedelic Consciousness, folks. David. Benny. Yes, um, right here. We're waiting for you. <laughs> so one of the things I learned along the way to becoming me is that there was alternate ways, other ways. I don't like the word alternate, but there are other ways to heal. And those ways were so very grained in ancient wisdom, plant-based we see it in our pop culture movies sometimes, but we don't talk about it enough. And, you know, I talked about my grandmama the other day and I, t she is looking down at me right now thinking, what is this girl going to say about me again? But I do, I talk about my grandma and I talk about my grandpa who from the old countries now I know my grandpa, Benny, came from uh, like Brazil. So now a lot of things make sense to me about like <laughs> what kind of stuff he grew. Ah. So once upon a time, he was Italian and that was it. A lot of but questions answered. So some to speak. of yes. the other herbs that the dude grew in that yeah. garden. It's like, where'd you learn how to grow that? dude? Uh-huh. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. But here's what I learned about these people. And it's really a, a, for me, I think about this now and I think about, Wow. I wish I would have learned more from him. I spent so much time with my grandpa in his shack in the Bronx, by the way. This is like, you know, we didn't live in like, this is the Bronx. And grandpa has got like these herb beds and he's growing stuff. And grandma got them in tea and putting them on your saws, your sores on your body. And then she's got it. So you're drinking stuff to calm you down. So what were these two up to? Now, fast forward to today. And let's just take a snapshot before I get at, at Daniel. The 12, oh, I'm going to get letters about this, but Google it. The 12 step program, Bill Wilson, Alcoholics Anonymous, Carl Jung. Bill W. had a spiritual awakening. That's the way it reads. When you do a little research, Bill cooked up some belladonna. And a couple of other things. And that's what he was given because that's what people got back then. That's what my mom got, those things. So why is it we have stopped talking about things like this? What is it about psychedelic consciousness that was such a part of the evolution of healing, not just in the United States and not just for a few times? but I'm talking about going back. And I got to tell you, Daniel did like a blockbuster job here. A lot to talk about. Daniel, it's great to have you. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Um, so a lot in the book, we're going to talk about many things, transformative healing, revelations. Uh, you know, I want to know two things. One, and you can answer them separately. I want to know why conversations about this have gotten lost along the way to healing. They're starting to come back now a little bit. 
Um, and what is it about your own personal journey that made this become a purpose for you? Thank you for asking this. Question. In any order, take that yeah. in any order. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start with the with the historical perspective because it's a pretty uh, complex one to to try and go about, but I'll I'll give it a shot here. And I think how you started off is is pretty spot on. I think for the majority of time that we've been living as human beings on this earth, uh, we have interacted, of course, with the natural world for not only our food, not only our water, not only our oxygen, not only our shelter and our, our overall sustenance and survival, but of course for healing as well. And it wasn't until uh, quite recently that um, the majority of our healing, of course, came from the natural world. And so, and, and even, even you know, a good amount of the modern medicine that we have today, what we're calling medicine, uh, came from some derivative of, of natural sources. Um, and so this is, this is deeply part of our journey. And, you know, there's some sort of variation at, at, at some point today, we've, we've said that some things are from the natural world are okay to use for healing. Um, but at some point along the way, we, we, we blocked off the, the usage of psychoactive plants that cause a certain uh, experience, uh, an alteration in, in consciousness and in individuals. And so this, is, this has become, um, I don't wanna say a trend over time, because I think for the majority of, of time we've been living here, you know, including of course in our uh, in indigenous cultures and pretty much in every single uh, continent throughout the, the world, we have brilliant examples of shamanism. Um, of course, in, you know, we have, we have uh, research in this in terms of cave drawings, in terms of modern yeah. usage, in terms of passed down storytelling, in terms of carbon dating, uh, certain artifacts where, of course, these psychoactive substances were found. Um, this, is, this has been a part of those cultures for quite some time. And on top of that, we also find it in larger civilizations as well, in, in Greek culture uh, and, you know, the result of the uh, uh, Eleusinian uh, mysteries, which were great initiation rituals. And I think in, in every major culture, you see reference to to sacred plants and mushrooms that not only provide healing, but deep spiritual um, uh, experiences as well. So when did this, when did this stop? You know, there's, there's been some cycles throughout history where in Greek culture after, I think it was about 4,000 years of these Eleusinian mysteries, um, there was uh, the church at the time and the ruler decided to, to stop it out. So it was a little yep. bit, who knows, maybe it was associated with paganism. There's a lot of debates. Oh, yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, our, our first modern drug laws came from when the Spanish Inquisition um, invaded in South America. And uh, it was in 1620 for peyote. And, and what they stated was, um, we're making it illegal, illegal. they associated with witchcraft because it could be for divining uh, future events or, or where something was. And I think in reality, it was just making something illegal that that current, that the Inquisition did not really understand. It was a direct, very divine experience. There was, you know, some some magic happening there that that they couldn't necessarily grapple with, and it was different from what they were used to in terms of healing at that time, and in terms of what they were calling a religious experience, and so uh, it became illegal. And you know, something about that carried to this day, um, and we didn't even hear about mushrooms in in Western culture, certainly in terms of magic mushrooms for about a hundred year time period. Um, and we really see the, the, the stomping out of these, of these substances, not only in, in culture, because it was so, you know, dangerous to use these, you'd be, you'd be hung, you'd be killed, you'd be prosecuted. So the, the ritualistic use was really, was really stomped out. And um, it's not to say that in America, uh, we had these, these drug laws, but you know, it didn't really exist in our, in our mindset and our culture. And so all of a sudden, you know, when you have in the, in the 1940s, uh, you know, with Albert Hoffman uh, discovering and synthesizing LSD, uh, Gordon Wasson being the first Westerner to take part um, in a psilocybin ceremony in 1955, and then the Time Magazine article released in 1957. Of course, all the experimentation that we know about in the 60s and all the research going on before then, all of a sudden there was an explosion of these, of these plants, mushrooms and substances. And, um, you know, I'm sure it was, it was quite shocking for everyone involved. And Take my word for it. Yeah. I, you know. I, 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 I was there. Just want you to know that. Um, 
it was shocking. And I love the way you just described the history of that for people that don't know. Mm. Because there's such a disconnect. You say something in the book, if you don't mind, if I could do this for a moment. Um, a couple of things you say in the book, but I love this here. Despite our increased awareness, human causation, we still attempt to change the world us rather than to change ourselves. That is a stuck point for me. Yeah. But then you go on and talk about the real question becomes, and this is really an important one for me, can we actualize the new way and shift our ideologies before it's too late? And I think about this, and in, in, in this is the crux of a question I had for myself on my own healing journey. You know, when conventional medicine couldn't do more than give me a pill, potion, or lotion, what was then left for me to learn about? You know, how do I get underneath the emotional aspect of being ill? You know, what's holding that back? How do I get down to those levels? You know, what is the spiritual nature of what we're talking about today, psychedelic consciousness? Why has this worked for tens of thousands of years on the planet? And this is my two cents. I'm not an expert on this. But why has it worked to the point that if we had not used it, some people question whether we'd be here today? Just thinking about that. But you outline for us the innate humanity of who we are. Now, here's the dilemma for me in the field I studied in. Didn't quite understand how it's not okay to naturally work with altering psychedelic mood changes, natural ceremony, rituals, plants. How is that not okay, Daniel, but a prescription synthetic over the counter four times a day to crush your anxiety? What's the difference? I think you bring up a phenomenal point here. And, you know, we've, we've deviated so far from the natural world. We've become so disconnected from the natural world, so disconnected from each other that this is, this is popping up in all sorts of ways. And I completely agree with you. The idea that we could somehow prohibit natural plants and mushrooms and our access to those is in my mind, beyond insanity, beyond rude, a complete affront against our natural rights, a complete affront against our, our natural freedoms, and obviously inherently um, unenforceable. And so there's a, there's a lot happening in, in this healing process of what you're talking about that goes down to some really deep levels. You know, we know uh, when we're explaining it uh, at the time, as, as Robert uh, Carhart Harris has spoken about and Michael Pollan pop uh, popularized in his book as well, you know, the focus in the default mode network and this, you know, we're, it's our hierarchy of brain functioning and there's a, there's a lowering of that, which kind of brings, brings our ego down and all of a sudden increases connections in the, in, in the rest of the, the brain, which leads to changes in cognition, perception, memory, you know, information that we're taking uh, into the world and potentially these deep uh, unifying experiences. And so all of a sudden new thought patterns are formed. And so if you're someone who's struggling with addiction, uh, PTSD, uh, anxiety related to, to terminal uh, illness and depression, these are all categories that a lot of this healing, a lot of the research is, is currently pointing towards and which modern medicine hasn't been able to heal. Um, and it's exactly like you're talking about. It's kind of going into the uh, trying to suppress the symptom rather than going to the root of the issue. And so what you have in the midst of the experiences, which are in, incredibly profound, uh, particularly if you enter into these, these unified states, is uh, they're noticing that, that there's something of a, an inner healer that's being evoked that if there is an energy towards a certain uh, point in your life that's holding a specific trauma, uh, whether it's about the depression or the PTSD, uh, somehow there's a, that experience, that moment, that feeling has an ability to rise up. And um, in that moment of identifying it, of accepting it, there's, there's some healing around it. 
And again, also we're creating new, new thought patterns rather than being stuck in it. So this is an incredible tool um, in that sense. And I think also on a, on a larger level, um, as I explained at some point throughout the book, I think we're finally stepping out of our, our strict separate individuality. And all of a sudden we're experiencing the world from, from a much larger expanded perspective, particularly in these, in these great unified uh, states. And so if you're acting from a place of wholeness, um, you know, if we, if we looked at our body and there, was, and there was a cut on our arm, our body knows to naturally heal that arm. But there's something emotionally that happens that sometimes it gets suppressed and we can't see it. And I think there's something happening where when we, when we again, step out into this place of, of wholeness, that's a little bit outside of our, you know, strict individual separate ego perspective, it seems we're able to identify, identify what needs healing. And in that process, then we can move towards it itself. Um, but, you know, again, why, you know, why are, are these things? I mean, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot in there. Of course, there's a lot of profit in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. There's a lot of, you know, when you're working in the psychedelic experience, it's like I said, it's incredibly profound and you take, you can step out from such a perspective that sometimes you see the complete insanity about our current paradigm, about how we're currently living. Um, so if you're someone who's endowed with protecting the status quo, you know, you might not want to try and understand that experience. You might say, whoa, 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 let's, uh, let's try and put a block on that. And, you know, maybe it's a little bit too intense, but of course now with, with all the research that's coming out, um, yeah. Yeah. And, all, and, and even more so in the research, the incredible amount of storytelling Oh yeah. and, and personal anecdotes of how incredibly healing, how incredibly spiritual, uh, revelatory, uh, insightful that these experiences can be. You can't, it, it's, it, it becomes impossible to ignore. Um, so yeah. I want to just say one thing about this, because this is really important for us to say, maybe, I don't know if you're going to agree with me or not. One of the things I'm really a fan of, and even if you go back a gazillion years, there was an expert in the tribe. You can call him a shaman. You could call her whatever you want to call her. But there was that person that had the knowledge that was passed down. That is the person that manage the treatment, manage the ritual. And when you look at this from at least what I know from the uh, indigenous people that I spend time with, I'm very clear from them. You do this with us. You don't do this on your own, Pat. You do this here because it's more than drinking that tea you're drinking right there, whatever that is. And I think this is where we ran into trouble in the 60s. And this is my take on it. It wasn't that there weren't groups studying this and really trying to piggyback off Bill Wilson and say, wow, that dude, how much belladonna did he take? Did he hit it with a morphine top off to have a spiritual awakening? And out of that came 1934 and the 12-step programs and AA and millions of people getting sober. They tried to understand that. What happened with that movement is it became a street economy of money. It became, yeah, you could do it this way controlled, or you could just go down the street and get a couple of yellow jackets and a bunch of other things. And so the book that you're talking about, and, I, and this is what I loved about it, is you're talking about whether they be substance-based technologies, you're talking about more than just the plant. You're talking about the process, the knowledge, the wisdom, the transfer. Some people do studies, it's controlled. You know what I mean? But that opens a door because I gotta ask you this question. People ain't healing. Medical marijuana was a huge fight in the state of Washington. I was one of the people beating the door down saying, come on, people are like, they're, they're cancer, they're in pain. I don't care what you do to take this out of it or that out of it. What is going to be the pathway to not have to fight so hard to help people heal? Mm. Yeah, I think you raise a really interesting point about ritual and about guidelines, about safety, about process, about transferring of uh, information and inherently a deep respect for the experience. Um, and so, 
you know, all of those things are, are what carried this in a safe way um, and in a comfortable way. And I think a large part of the healing itself, right? And so in all of these uh, early cultures that I, that I mentioned beforehand, all of the civilizations, there was a container, uh, there was a ritual, there was a guideline, and that's incredibly, incredibly important. And of course, there are variations on that theme. Um, you know, there's been the classic mantra of set and setting for a long time uh, in the psychedelic world. And I also talk about in the book, making sure uh, to have preparation, support, and integration. And if you're preparing beforehand, if you're readying yourself for the experience, if you've gotten attention, if you're coming into it with a deep amount of respect and dispelling all the myths that are out there and um, preparing yourself for the, uh, the states of consciousness that you might encounter, you're gonna go into a way better way. If you have someone who is supporting you during it, whether this be a classic shaman, whether this be a modern day therapist, whether this be um, you know, a, uh, a close friend who has a lot of experience that is, that is compassionate and that, and that you trust, um, these are all gonna really help you in the process itself, help you ease into it, feel safe, feel comfortable, and really dive inward to actualize the healing. Cause you know, you could, um, you know, there's, there's, there's incredible experiences to be had about, um, you know, without going in, inward and, and interacting with the world. And of course there's revelation, but it seems that when the deepest healing is being done, it correlates with a mystical experience. Uh, with this deep unified state. And so in order to get there, you have to feel very safe um, and you have to be able to go inward and you have to really be able to flow with the experience. And likely if you're not feeling comfortable or safe, you're not gonna be able to hit that level. So the deep, the deep healing has gotta come from that. And of course the integration work after is, is just as important, if not more important than anything else to how do I actually bring this healing into my life now? Whether this is again, a matter of healing, whether this is revelation, there's this insight creativity, um, the taking it forward is just as important because yes, you can, you know, you can gain a lot uh, from one experience. And, you know, again, it's important to say it is an experience. This isn't a concept, you know, um, this is you're directly uh, interrelating with this revelation, this truth and this healing. So it's, it's in you and it sticks with you, but you still need to have the support around you to actually bring that in um, and to integrate it. Yeah. And so, you know, you talk about um, how do we, how do we do this? Um, and it's a really incredible question because as you mentioned in the sixties, there's a lot of the, you know, uh, Timothy Leary tune in, turn on, drop out. And I think what's so powerful about what's happening and the rhetoric that's coming out of the, the psychedelic movement, Renaissance community, patchwork community, whatever you want to call it, is it's really, um, based in integration rather than revolution. And maybe the act itself and the experience itself is quite revolutionary. Again, when you live in such a separated, disconnected world and all of a sudden you enter into a space of unity and infinite love and great healing, there's, there's going to be some juxtapositions. You're going to look at the world and say, why this, this, these chemicals? Why are we harming the world and polluting the world? And, and it's, you know, it almost becomes, again, insanity once you see things from that perspective. And um, Well, you know the definition of insanity, don't you? What's that? Doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Isn't that what we're doing to try to heal people? Exactly. Um, exactly. You know, look, I had a lot to talk to you about. We're going to take a short break. Sure. Benny, three copies. This is a fantastic book. Um, gosh, I wish we had some imagery. David, you're going to have to look up the ayahuasca plant because I'm going to talk about it when we come back. Um, 1-800-930-2819, 1-800-930-2819. Uh, we've got copies of the book to give away. Before we go to break, I want people to know how to find out more about you, how to get the book on their own, Daniel, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, absolutely. There's there's a ton of ways. You can go directly through my website, danielgrower.com. You can get it through uh, my publisher's website, intertraditions.com. You can also get it through uh, IndieBound, Amazon, uh, and Barnes and Noble as well. So it's all, it's all out there and, and all available on, on all those sites. So true confessions. We're going to go to break, Benny. True confessions. Sitting down. Benny knows my uncle Ralph when he was alive. Uncle Ralph, Uncle Al, came on the show, did a segment, cussed a lot in Italian. But I got to really grill him on some things. Thank you, Ancestry.com, for allowing me to look up 
why we all felt different, why grandpa looked different, and find out where do you think grandpa was born and why do you think he was growing a lot of stuff in the Bronx? Brazil comes from Brazil, ayahuasca, depression. My mother had it, committed suicide. My dad, my grandpa tried to help her. What is it we don't know, don't want to explore that could help countless people for the anxiety of the way we live in the world? And I want to just say this before we hop over to break. Anybody that has ever had any physical trauma, and I've shared a little bit about my own journey, physical abuse, whatever you want to call it, your own version of Law and Order SVU. What could possibly be a way to remove what Carolyn Mace calls the tissue memory of those? What might have I done and what have I done to reach down at some of the deepest parts of me to be free from that trauma? We're going to come back and I can't wait. I can't wait because we're going to talk about something with the book calls Get in there. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. It's great to have all of you tune us in, turn us on. If you are watching this, go over and check it out on Transformation Talk Radio over at Facebook. Uh, and if you're listening, then you're listening through Transformation Talk Radio, one of our affiliate stations. If you're in Seattle, you're probably got it on KKNW on the dial. It doesn't matter how you listen. This is like what we do. Uh, so and you want to go over to Facebook and put your information in there, then you could also tell, uh, let's see, who are we going to tell? We're going to tell David and David will get that at you right away. We'll get some information and off we go. Um, if you want to find out more about Daniel, Daniel, let's hit everybody up with how to get a copy of the book on their own, how to find out about you, how to follow you on social media and any other place you are. Sure. So yeah, how to get a copy of the book. You can either go to my website at danielgrower.com. You can go to my publisher's website at innertraditions.com. You can also find it on IndieBound, Barnes and Noble, and Amazon as well. Uh, and so you can find it all online and some of your, it's possible your local bookstores can have it as well if you ask them. Uh, in terms of information about me, I have, I have some information on my website about events, current happenings, all of that. And then I also have uh, for social media, I have an Instagram account that's under psychedelic.consciousness. So I'll be updating that. And that's the best place to find everything. You know, writing a book like this, Daniel, if I might say, uh, it is a bold move. I don't care what day and age you think we're living in. It is a bold move. Um, it's a bold move for a lot of reasons. It's a bold move because political nature of where we are. Uh, it's a bold move because we're not really conscious enough to think to save the Amazon. Uh, it's a bold move because uh, you're going against the grain with a lot of people that don't understand this. They don't understand the way you've got it in the book. They hear blah, 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 psychedelic. And that means my kid's going to overdose from LSD. That is not what we're talking about today. Right. And you have an entire section of the book on this. I mean, you don't leave this out. I'm certain glad you didn't leave it out because you do talk about legality and personal responsibility. This is as personally responsible uh, of an item because for me, it has a spiritual nature. So I'm very mindful of how I respect spirit. Hasn't always been the case. Pretty disrespectful along the way when I was younger, just saying. But I learned differently. I learned in my first ceremony in the high desert in California. I learned how I changed instantaneously and couldn't explain it. I learned how I was open to living a different life, a more open life than what I had lived before. Um, and I was learning how to eliminate the pain in my body. Because for me, 
you know, I had a couple things going on. What do we need to do to get there? You have a chapter in your book that's called Getting There. And, you know, what I love about this is the question you ask, what is it we desire to be? That's what you ask. And what does it mean to be that in every moment? One would suspect such innate, age-old questions would bring us to a compendulum of answers. But boy, it is like we have lost that part of searching in the black hole of infinity. <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean to you? Yeah, well, first off, um, I just want to I just want to add out to some points that you mentioned earlier about the the boldness of writing and. Um, you know, when I first, when I first embarked on this writing journey, it was about six years ago and it was a complete, uh, it was a call to justice. It was after a profound ayahuasca experience that I had. And after experiencing such revelation and truth for me, it was again, the rudest, the craziest, the most insane thing that someone can tell me that I could not access, um, those, those states of spirit and those states of healing. And so, uh, regardless of what was happening in the world, it was it was a great call, and it was it was scary, and it was a bit um, it was a bit before as as prevalent as it is now. Of course, all the research coming out, the media attention that's been happening, the amount of stories um, now it's you know now now I feel pretty pretty darn safe, even though it still is quite a quite a taboo topic. When I first started, that wasn't the case, and I think it it segues into what you're talking about in terms of getting there in the midst of that ayahuasca experience. I had a complete ego death um, and becoming nothing, I became everything type of experience of, uh, of the unitive state. And it was, it was incredibly blissful, um, incredibly revelatory and taught me so many things. And in that moment, I finally viewed death as a transformation rather than an ending. And, and you know, there, again, there are many things that came out of it, but I wanna, I wanna highlight this, this unitive state. Because what 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 is it that we that we crave to be? Uh, what is it that we're really looking for? Um, and again, particularly in a society that we've become so disconnected from the world, I think really what we're looking for is to feel that we're a part of this world, that we're truly connected to everything, and that uh, within there is an eternal state of oneness that transcends our individuality, that transcends our death, that transcends everything. There is this. There's that at the core. Uh, and you find this, of course, at the, at the core of every single religion, um, at, you know, particularly in the mystical sense. And this is, in my mind, what's really fundamental to the psychedelic experience. I think now more than ever, I mean, this is a report that came out in 2013. There are 30 million people in the US alone who had tried psychedelics at some point in their life. And you know, maybe some of them were ritualistic and guided, maybe a lot of them were experimentation with, with, without that. Um, but the truth is people are, are searching for something. And I think the way we currently live isn't satisfying something deep that we're yearning for. Um, and so we're, what we're craving for is something transcendent and something that's, that's unified. And again, to understand that we are, we are a part of this world and that's, that's an incredibly healing thing. And when you look at the rise of meditation, when you look at the rise of yoga in our society, I think they're hitting on this same point. We're really, we're really craving something. We're really searching for something. And it certainly feels as if as much destruction, oppression, systemic racism, pandemic, terrible um, ecological suicide that's, that's happening, um, there, it does feel like we could potentially be on the cusp of something. It's, yeah. it's you know, towards something. And I think again, this, this something is, is understanding our inherent unity. And um, again, when you look at all these religions, it seems like that's the goal. Um, and what we're talking about in all these creation stories and, and all throughout time is the going from nothingness to somethingness or from singularity to multiplicity. Or if you look at the, look at the Big Bang, we're all a part of a singular process here. And somehow we, we forget that. And certainly the way we're living makes us really forget that. Um, and so if you look at all of these, these pathways in these religions, they're all just different, different directions, different approaches, as Ram Dass would say, to get up to the same point on the mountain or the, yeah. same, or, or the same point within. And I think a beautiful way of, of explaining it is if you look at ultimate spirit, in the way of water, right? Us really interacting with, with 
truly experiencing it. I think in the, you know, in the psychedelic experience, when you're, when you're in these unitive states, it's, it's that you're, you're really immersive. It's direct. There's no separation from it. Right. And over time, when we've had religions and, and great mystical experiences in all corners of the world, once you drink that water, once you've had the ultimate spiritual experience of complete unity with, with the divine, with everything, with God, whatever term you want to put on it, you want to share that with people because you realize in that moment, this is the ultimate thing. This is what we're after here. And there's no doubt about it. Right. So all of a sudden, as I'll, as I'll explain with a little cup here, you know, you, you want to, you want to create a container to pass on that water to someone else, that ultimate spiritual experience. And in my mind, this is the process of religion, right? This is the process of creating pathways, uh, different spiritual texts, what have you, of being able to then pass it to someone else to drink it. However, we run into the issue of people mistaking the glass for the water itself. This is when religions get too dogmatic, when hierarchies come into place, when people use it for power, all that kind of stuff. However, once you've, once you've had the experience of drinking, drinking the water of experiencing ultimate spirit, then you start to appreciate every container and every single pathway that is, because you see it for what it is, a container. If it hasn't been sealed off, then it could actually pass on that way. And so it's in my opinion that, you know, this is this kind of as I'll call it, respectful pluralism, respecting every single religion as a pathway to get there and not saying one is better than the other, whatever calls to you, wherever you're at on your journey is incredibly, incredibly important. And this is something that Stanislav Grof found in a lot of his research on psychedelics, yeah. that this is the mindset that the, the mystical psychedelic experience when integrated and supported, this is what it engenders. It's, it's a universal understanding of spirituality of a, of a mystical experience. And you begin to appreciate it rather than saying my way is better than your way. Um, and I think if we're going to, if we're going to come together um, and we need to do the incredible work that needs to be done to, to start working in harmony with each other, to heal the deep oppression and the deep trauma that we have and to start working in harmony with the earth, it's going to come from this place of inherent unity. Uh, and it's going to come from this place of inherent respect for every living being as a part of that unity. And every and respect for the for the for the multifacetedness for the yeah. incredible complexity and diversity that's involved, um, and so so for me that's that's mm -hmm. that, that's how we get there. That's, yeah. that's, that's part of the way of getting there. Yeah, and you know one of the things I too want to talk about here, and I want to interject it in based on what you said. When huh. I talk about, let's just say ayahuasca for a moment. Um, I want to make sure if you all are looking at this, do your research, take a look at the studies I think that Daniel has just pointed out. And these are controlled studies. For example, it's really clear in my community that entertaining ayahuasca for things like psychotic disorder or schizophrenia, not such a good idea. But if you look at the studies on depression and the lasting effect of it, um, the studies that are coming out now with random groups, uh, placebo effects, double blind studies, the introduction of music, the results are staggering when you look at these studies. So past evidence is now building on new evidence. And these are studies done by Hallmark universities, right? You know, this is one of the things that when you read a line from a study, uh, and this one's a little bit old, but it's a 2015 study uh, where it says as a result, and this is shocking in this world, by the way, in the, in the psychology world, a single ayahuasca session had a fast onset depression, antidepressant effect. What? And then they go on to talk about the scientists that now come in and why it's receiving attention from scientists now beyond this, because it's almost as if it seems impossible, right? It seems impossible. Um, outside of just this one particular conversation, of course, there are other things that you'll read about, uh, LSD, mushrooms, um, but the science now, the science of this is people are spending money to research it. So let's just start with the money part, because back in the day, you couldn't get money to research this. 
But universities are being funded to study it, to research it, and provide empirical results. Isn't that too what it might take for us to have a larger scale, um, I'm not going to say acceptance of it, but curiosity? What do you think? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, particularly, you know, in, in our current society, we are really, really bent on science, on rationality, and, and that's great. And so for, for us, the way to move forward is going to be proved in those, you know, quote unquote, proved in those same contexts. Obviously, for once you've had the experience, um, this all is, it, it's, it's axiomatic, it's, it's obvious, you know, that these things are healing, that these things are revelatory. Um, but for, for folks who haven't experienced it, and, and, and more importantly, for, for, for folks who doubt um, the potential of psychedelics, absolutely, the research is the best way forward. And that's where I give a lot of gratitude and a lot of thanks for organizations like MAPS, you know, which is for almost a 30 year time period has been has been banging at the door of the government, just trying to be allowed to do this research. You know, it was it was prevented from uh, you know 1970s uh, up until the late 1990s. You couldn't even do research. You weren't even allowed to. Which is you know how many things really are that that you know again that are natural that you can't even do research on. Um, I think the first one was a Rick Strassman DMT research study, which is kind of fascinating when you think about it, considering how uh, intense the DMT experience could be. Um, but then in the early uh, 2000s, you started to have more of the research starting to be allowed. And of course that's opened up, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the dam is broken again. It's opened up a huge uh, flow of research happening all over the place. And at first it started happening with maps. And then uh, as you mentioned, certain universities uh, like Johns Hopkins, which has re recently uh, launched a new uh, center uh, directly directly focused on that. Um, and so this is this is incredibly important just to explain it in the current language that we're now accustomed to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and you have to explain it. And one of the things you touched upon earlier, and I want to get back to it, is I'm giving people a couple of empirical studies. I subscribe to journals. So I track some of this and I just see what people are doing. But when you read about um, shall I call it anecdotal? When you read about anecdotal scenario, again, in Brazil, Brazil has the most overstressed prison system like in the world. 550,000 inmates, they had one of the most horrific revolts in 2002 or something like that. And then in comes this guy, and it was bloody. This was a bloody prison thing. It was like, oopsie, that is not going to work out. I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. In comes now, here you go. Enter in somebody that gets an idea and says, aha, why don't we try ayahuasca on these people? One person's idea, a failing prison system, horrific prison system. And now part of the culture, they decide to do this. And the anecdotal results when you read about this and what it did and prisoners making amends to their victims. I mean, when you read about this, it is hard to imagine I mean, these are hardened criminals. I'm serious. Take a life just as soon as look at you. What do you think about that? I loved when I saw that that uh, that study and that suggestion came out. I thought it was just beautiful. Uh, you know, because there's so much there's so much involved there in terms of uh, you know the drug war. Um, that's come about and, you know, you know, putting people in prison as a result of using drugs that all of a sudden we're now seeing that the same drugs that they're putting people in for are the ones that can help people get out of it and heal. So there's, there's something pretty uh, incredible about that, that juxtaposition in itself. But I think it's, it's spot on and it, it, it leads to an interesting statement, which might seem for some folks a little bit extreme to say, but what we're talking about is these 
plants and mushrooms can not only heal and bring about revelation, but it seems like we're talking about becoming better humans. Um, and at some point we've, we've lost track of our humanity. And what does that look like, right? So when you're talking about being able to, uh, in this situation to, you know, heal in such a way that you can, that you wanna now be integrated back into society and, and realize perhaps the wrong that you've done and take a walk through a pretty intense um, moral experience to really think about what happened and, and then desire to come out and apologize rather than beforehand yeah. not. So we have to look at that and say what's happening again, all of a sudden, if you start feeling you're connected to the world, if you start realizing how innately connected you are to other humans and living beings, you don't want to harm them. It's the yeah. complete opposite. You want to help them. And so a lot of this research that's coming out is not only it's helping people in this context that have been in prison, but probably help them from, from not arriving there. There was a, there was a study that came out that showed uh, like, uh, con not continued, that psychedelic use generally correlated with uh, a decrease in crime for individuals. Yeah. It's also, there's been research- Which that, is counterintuitive to what the media has said. Right, right, exactly. I mean, it's right. Really blown out of proportion. Um, but when you look at it, yeah, it's leading to increased empathy. It's leading to increased openness, increased sociality, um, an increased sense of meaning and purpose. Uh, again, understanding yourself as a, as a part of the whole rather than separate. These are all incredible things, incredible tools to be able to move forward in the world. If we could be more empathetic, more compassionate towards each other, I mean, that's that's a beautiful society. That's a society that I certainly I certainly want to want to live in. Um, and in regards to the media that's come about over the years, I mean, of course, there's particularly when there was so much use happening uh, before we really were able to integrate, you know, the great wisdom from a lot of these indigenous cultures on on the best ritualistic guided ways to do it. Of course, there were there were mishaps. These are really really powerful tools um, and really powerful living entities and living beings that were. Kind of co-evolving with but you know it's important to recognize that any tool has a harm potential you know even water oh. can burn us fire can burn you know it as stanislav Grof said in the famous quote you know a knife in the hands of a, a chef a, a murderer um a surgeon and and a young child of course is something very different but it's the same tool and so i think a lot of the times in, in the media with all of these crazy stories it was very very small uh, statistically small examples that were blown out of proportion of, again, before even we were really focusing on ritualistic and guided yeah. and safe contextual use when there were, there were some mishaps. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And the other thing, I mean, we're talking about Timothy Leary who decides to use a different drug and try something not necessarily in a controlled condition. And that was one of the first studies done where it was, it, he said like, oopsie, yeah, it may work for depression, but these folks over here that have other uh, illnesses, it's not working for. Um, we have a hard line in the United States. We don't experiment on people. That's our hard line here. That's why so much of this research, except for UCLA, they've got a professor, who is it? Bog, Bong, I can't remember his name, um, in UCLA. Uh, except for here and there, most of this research is not being done here because we have very strict ethical experimenting on people. I mean, my research was on the edge of not getting approved because I was studying something that triggered an effect. I was studying betrayal and broken promises. So they were like, oh, what are you gonna do when this? But, but we have to look outside to see who are the societies like Brazil that really didn't have any other path of recourse? I mean, their prison system, they didn't really have another path of recourse at all. I want to ask you, we've got a couple of minutes left. A lot in the book, a lot we've talked about, a lot we didn't talk about. I, I want to thank you for today and for writing such an incredible book. You know, it's a beautiful blend of science, spirituality, and action. Um, Again, I'd love to know what your personal message, and then please tell folks how they can find out more about you, Daniel. Thank you for all that you're doing on this to make us all more aware. Oh, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. Uh, so in, ter in terms of where to find out more, again, uh, website, danielgrower.com, or through uh, an Instagram page for psychedelic.consciousness. That's where I'll be updating things the most. You can always uh, hop on to my email list on the website. And so that way, that's, that's the, best, the best way to access. Um, 
in terms of uh, in terms of a wider scale personal message. Um, I would say for me, what I'm really really hoping out of providing this this message, it's really on behalf of the earth itself, on behalf of the plants and mushrooms, and uh, on behalf of um, the the deep ecological destruction that's that's happening right now and it's my greatest hope that we could move forward together and help use these experiences to understand our deep interconnection between each other and the natural world and the livingness of the natural world itself and so that hopefully we can move forward with a heightened sense of respect with a heightened sense of reverence and hopefully uh, an, an increased degree of action so that we can all move forward and help prevent this incredible catastrophe that we're all marching forward uh, towards. And um, that, that means different things for different people. And it's gonna mean a truly indifferent uh, small choices and small actions on all of our parts uh, to bring, to again, bring back a, a state of harmony between ourselves and between, yeah. between the natural worlds. So that's, my, that's my greatest hope through all of this. I wanna thank you for that. And I got a question. Let me just answer it real quick. Uh, yes. Uh, go and look at the more recent studies for Angie for you, and you'll find CNN did a, a real good expose and referenced some studies from 2018. Uh, also, that particular study had to do with PTSD. So you got to do your homework. You got to check where the source of the study came from, uh, not from an internet page, but check the source, check what people are saying. And then you should be able to find your way to more information. Uh, but again, none of this gets done without proper supervision, and it is not a one-size-fits-all. That's why Daniel wrote this fantastic book. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time.